Hello and welcome. My name is Greg Aiden with Aiden Leadership, and thank you for watching another edition of Servant Leadership Podcast. And today I've got the great pleasure of introducing you to uh, a man I've admired from afar. He doesn't know that as much as uh, I do, especially on Twitter. We've met a few times on Zoom. But ladies and gentlemen, I want to in introduce you to Mark Crowley. Mark, how are you today? I'm great, Greg. Thanks for having me on. Very nice uh, to be with you. Absolutely. I said I've been an admirer from, from afar, meaning I've, I've watched what you say and how you say it, and uh, being an expert in leadership yourself, I'm, I'm, uh, I've always been taken by the, um, the calmness and the courageous words that you, you share on Twitter, and uh, although I have not read your book, Lead from the Heart, which came out, I understand, about 10 years ago, tell us a little bit about yourself, Mark, where are you from? What you do today, I know you're a consultant, a speaker, and a podcaster, but uh, share with the audience the, the why. Why does Mark Crowley do the things that he does? That's a great question. I love how you set that up. So I grew up in Garden City, Long Island. Um, just ring the bell. And But for most of my life now, uh, my adult life, I've lived in La Jolla, California. Where I went to college here at the University of California at San Diego and decided this is where I want to live the rest of my life. And I kind of needed that stability. So I've managed to make that kind of work. Um, but in the process of my career, after my mom died, I was raised by a psychologically and emotionally abusive father who mm -hmm. really beat down my self-esteem and then kicked me out of the house with no money, no support. And so I kind of had to figure out how am I going to survive while basically progressing in my life. And so when I started managing people, Greg, you know, I missed out on basically love. I missed out on full direction and encouragement and appreciation. And so um, just having some, having my back, no one had my back. And so when I started managing people, I unconsciously gave people that. And without realizing or connecting my upbringing to how I was managing people, I got phenomenal performance out of them. So I kept getting promoted. I kept thinking everybody manages this way. And I was 43 years old when a woman managed people very differently compared to what everybody else is doing. And I kind of had like this much information like inside of my own and 98 of it was hers so i just started probing it and realizing mm -hmm. that oh my god i this is what drove this so i started to refine those practices and then later ended up deciding that i wanted to put something in paper and write a book but what i intended to write was just if you do these things if you do these practices yeah you're going to lead people and drive great performance well in the process of it, I was urged to explain why it worked. And that led me to spending over a year looking for validation for why what I was doing with people mattered. Mm -hmm. And the science boils down to showing that the heart actually has profound influence in shaping human performance. And so to answer your question, Greg, with that as a preamble, is that when I finally realized that I'm not just writing a book for a bucket list, I'm actually, I have something very meaningful to say, which is yeah. we have to blow up the way we're managing people. We have to bring the heart in. And so, you know, the book came out 10 years ago. I just spent the summer writing a second edition of it, but you know, I've spent all this time trying to lay the groundwork for acceptance because we think the heart is weak in leadership and it's actually just the opposite. Amen. Yeah. I'd like to start with the heart for a second and, and tell the audience or share with, share with us exactly why do you believe the heart is so critical relative to leadership? And tell us a little bit about how you found out the truth and that is, in, in fact, what it is. So sitting exactly where I am, I'm having a conversation with a former colleague of mine. And at this point, you know, we were, we've both been in senior vice presidents running big businesses and financial services. And he kind of knew what my journey was and knew where I was in the situation. And he goes, you know, you're going to have to explain this, right? Yeah. And I said, what do you mean? And he goes, well, people are, you know, people are going to think you need to have a shitty childhood in order to lead this way. That was his language. And I realized in a minute, Greg, it's like, oh my God, like I hadn't even given that a thought. I just thought people would take me at my word. Sure. So I started to think about, well, what, what, what was it that I was doing? And it, it hit me one day, like about a week later, that I was affecting the hearts in people. 
So I went in and told my wife, I've wasted a year of my life because everybody that I used to work with is going to laugh at the idea of leading with heart. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, like I was really bummed out. It sounds like this great epiphany, but I was kind of thinking, man, this is, this is really bad news. So my wife said, well, haven't you already proved it? Like, haven't you already like validated this? So there must be evidence for it. So it was that combination that okay. led me to looking for research. And it led me to a woman named Mimi Ganeri, who is a who graduated number one in her class in medical school. She's had a NPR, you know, uh, television show recently. She's a very legitimate cardio surgeon. And I wrote her and said, because she had just written this book that implied that the heart had more intelligence. So I wrote her and went and met with her. And Greg, I walk into her room office, messy. She doesn't even get up and she just looks at me and she said, Mr. Crowley, you figured out something we're just figuring out in medicine. And I had tears coming down my eyes because it was like this mess. I didn't know she was going to tell me. I just knew she was going to validate my whole life experience. And so what she said was, you know, when I went to medical school, they said, treat the heart like a carburetor. There's no humanity. And mm. so she said, I started having people come into my practice with serious heart problems and I'd get to know them and they had drinking problems or bad marriages or stressful jobs, you know, financial setbacks. She said, if it's a car part, if it's a, like a carburetor, parts don't respond to those kinds of experiences. So no. she said, I realized in that moment that we were wrong, that the heart and the mind are connected. They're meant to work together. And we've isolated them in business that so we think we need to be the brain is keep the heart out and i'm yeah. saying it's not heart it's not all mine it's got to be in balance oh love it i'm definitely going to get this i've always believed that the heart is is the is the keeper of who we really are and where we're really coming from and uh, i'd like i'd really like for you to go deeper into the science behind it because i believe that the leaders that are listening the leaders that have an opportunity to lead better and in my, in my opinion, that is get out of your head and get into your heart, or at least understand the connection. So I guess, Mark, two questions. One, can you share, or would you mind sharing a little bit more about the science and your research? And you did mention the connection between head and heart, and I know there's a lot of people out there that believe that. So if you could go into both of those for us, I'd, I'd really appreciate it. Yeah, the, there's something called the vagus nerve, and in, in the vagus nerve connects the heart and the mind. So at any one given point, for, for example, you're having a conversation with me and you're having a sensation of this is a disaster. I got to end this interview. That experience, if that's true, right, it, it starts with a feeling and then your mind goes, you know, just like hang up on them. Like, so it's the, the feeling first and, and okay. the mind then makes a decision. Now it can work the other way around, but most people don't realize that it will works that way most of the time. Like our feelings and emotions are driving our behavior most of the time. Sure. And this is important when you think about <laughs> engagement. You know, I, I, I have this term called emotional currency. It's like we need to give people this emotional experience, positive emotions, because that's what human beings thrive on. So I learned that, by the way, through positive psychology that shows that that human beings are actually hardwired to thrive on positive emotions and that whether it's in a marriage or in a relationship relationship with a boss and an employee or just with friendships with just life experience we need to have at least a ratio of four positive positive emotions to every one negative life brings us negative ones all the time sure. so in work it's almost you have to be intentional about giving people encouragement and praise and appreciation and growth and all those kinds of things that create positive emotions so that people feel really good. Mm -hmm. But meanwhile, um, there's the head of research at the Institute of Heart Math. He's one of the co-founders, he's been there for 30 years, and his name is Dr. Roland McCready. And what he's told me is that he goes, look, you were a genius the way you were managing people. And of course, I wasn't a genius. I was running on instinct of sure. what, what I need. Given how depraved I was and deprived, mm -hmm. not depraved, deprived, how I, deprived I was, I gave people what I always thought I needed would help me thrive. And of course, it worked. And what he said was, he says, when people are, are experiencing positive emotions, they perform optimally. Mm -hmm. But he said the reason they perform optimally is because of what's called coherence. 
So that communication that's going on between the heart and the mind, by the way, the heart gives more communication to the brain than the other way around. And the heart is formed in the body in an embryo before the brain. So we think we're all brain driven. We think the brain is telling the heart, you know, when to pump and it's, none of that's true. But what he said was, is that <laughs> when you create those conditions by giving people love, basically, it's all translates into love, true. that it gives them this optimal communication between the heart and the mind. And when people are having that experience, it calls, he, he calls it coherence. Mm -hmm. When the heart and the mind are working together as they're designed to do, you're setting people up to perform at their highest capacity. And he goes, and that's why you were a genius. Because the reason you got people to perform for you, the reason you had people beating a path to work for you, the reason that, you know, it didn't matter whether it was a man or a woman, age difference, education difference, everyone responded is because we're all human beings. And when you treat people the way you treat them, you are setting people up to perform in extraordinary ways. And of course, that's what I found. It's fascinating because what your op a door that you're opening and to a lot of us, Mark, that really haven't even considered the connection between the mind and the heart. And I do want to go back and and um, put my own take on something you said that the the ratio of four to one positive influence, positive behavior towards another human being helps them feel a certain way. I I'm just going to ask you to validate what I'm hearing. There is that also needs to be authentic. It needs to be genuine. Correct. Yeah, you can't fake any of this, right? In fact, because we're we are feeling sensing beings, if people try to I'll just use the vernacular, if people try to fake it or bullshit their way through this, we actually do more harm to people when we try to fake it, you know. So it has to come from here if you want it to go to there. Good. No, no, I I appreciate that. I wanted to I wanted to pull that out because some people don't understand that the engagement issue that was going on ha is still going on, but engagement, employee engagement has been a big thing for a long time. And I've always said it's it's nice that you stop by someone's desk on your way to your big office and ask them how their weekend was, but if it's not authentic or not genuine, if, as you're walking by, you're asking somebody a question, you really don't care the answer. You just want to look. Or, or you're like, uh, yeah, Greg, uh, tell me about your weekend. <laughs> you know, and I, people I, are completely distracted. I do that all the time. And I, mean, I, I feel that. I, I share that example that you just showed on camera there, Mark, uh, when, when I'm demonstrating, when you, when you ask somebody a question, listen. And, and listen with ease too. Pay attention, be present, be, be patient with what they're gonna say next. It, you might just learn something. Um, I, I'm fascinated by the heart because it's, it, it's for years and maybe be, even before Brene Brown kind of said, hey, vulnerability and courage are next door neighbors and they're both very powerful. She does talk about the heart. There's a lot of people who, who talk about heart-led leadership, but you're really bringing science and experience to all of us in your book, uh, uh, Lead, Lead from the Heart. And I can't wait to, to read your second one. Let me ask you this, as, as far as servant leadership is concerned, uh, which is the, the name of my show, and I've been a big proponent of servant leadership even before I left the big, the big corporate job to start my own firm. What does servant leadership mean to you, Mark? And, and what do you recommend we do with the, the term servant leader? Um, you asked some really great questions and you're very insightful. Um, so to, to your point a second ago, I've, I've lived my life this way. Like I've managed people this way and I, I have learned from experience what works and what doesn't. And so I kind of, I don't want to say I've perfected it, but I understand what moves the needle and how to influence people. And, and, and also to your point, um, this is no metaphor. This is, this is not a metaphor. This is literally, you, you're, you, you need to be focused on the hearts and people. Mm -hmm. And so I really appreciate you asking that or, or, or saying that. So I'm a little uncomfortable in the 21st century with the term servant leadership, okay. uh, the operant, operant word being servant. Mm -hmm. The other component of this is that, um, I, I was just thinking about this today, actually, so interesting you asked me. The other aspect of leadership is that you have to be driving performance. Like you have a job to do. Right. So you're not just serving people. You're also taking care of business, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is where people can my message and think, oh, he's just, 
kumbaya, like, you know, and just wants to love people. And like, that's not the message at all. You're supporting people with the intention of getting the job done, right? And this is the best way I found to do that, right? And there's plenty of evidence of it. That's very mm -hmm. much aligned to Greenleaf's original, you know, it, truthfully. Um, I, somebody asked me when I first put the book came out and I was speaking and they said, how does this compare? And I, I wasn't even familiar with it. And I looked kind of stupid. I, look, I don't even know what you're talking about. So I <laughs> looked into that's it, ironic. of course. It's very much, you know, um, yeah, it just wasn't in financial services is not a term. I mean, really, no. the people that I used to work with were pretty ruthless. Yeah, and, no. and, and ironically, the people that I worked for. So so the higher I got in the organization, the more ruthless people got. I've said this publicly before that they, it becomes Machiavellian. You know, they, you, you start climbing up the ladder and you suddenly feel a, a foot on your hand because mm -hmm. people are very insecure and very threatened at that level. So they're not being managed the way I'm talking about it. They got there by hook or crook, like competitiveness, and they're not gonna let somebody coming up who they think threatens them or feels talented or whatever. Right. So it's kind of a whole mess. But so the language of servant leader, I, I would like to call it like serving leadership mm. or supportive leadership or caring, but it exists. So. Um, you know, but I, on, I honor the underlying philosophy of it, clearly. Well, and, and I honor the, what, the connections of the two, and, and it's, it's, it gives me even more respect for you to do all the research that you've done and put the book together, lead from the heart, not even knowing servant leadership was a thing. But it's impossible to succeed, in my opinion, with people, unless you're feeling or understanding what someone else is feeling. And in, in my world, in my in my life, and especially my relationships, it's called humility, and it's called empathy. And it's, again, not to appease or baby or coddle, it's to understand where someone else is coming from. I'd love for you to comment on humility and or empathy, Mark, and, and tell me how does that work into what you say or what you, you believe is, is relative to how we lead from the heart? You know, the, the, the way you set this up is absolutely true. We get into, you know, the mind tells us we need to get people productive. So how do we do that? We clear all the shit off their desk and we treat them, teach them how to learn outlook and be, be masterful planners of their time. And, you know, we, we do all these efficiency kinds of things and, and we go, we're going to make you so much more productive. And mm -hmm. people are like, you know, what's in this for me? Like, why, why does that matter? Like, just so you can get more. And I think that's the traditional view of leadership is mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not here to support you or serve you. I'm paying you to do a job. Now go do it. Right. I'm holding you accountable. And then, by the way, and if you don't do it, my mind's telling me, I'm going to treat you like shit. I'm going to mm. like, hey, wh where are you on this? And when are you going to get this to me? And, you know, we're going to have to have a conversation, Greg, if, you know, if uh, you don't get this to me by Friday. And so now we're managing with fear. And people are mar marinating in cortisol. And it's all the mind telling us this is how, we sp how we're supposed to be managing people. And ironically, people are experiencing it here, not here. Mm -hmm. So they're like, wait a minute. All they're trying to do here is get what they want. They don't care what I want. This right. all this productivity stuff they're trying to teach me isn't for me, it's for them. And so you have this massive collision and there's no trust and there's no engagement, which is why engagement all over the world is so bad. It's 20, 20% 20 in across the world, 36% newest numbers um, in, in uh, America. And you've got like 20 to 25% of the working population across the world that is in the hate category, meaning they're, they're called actively disengaged, where they're so unhappy, they become saboteurs mm -hmm. for their boss. They want to see their boss fired. They want to see their boss get punished. They want to, they, you know, and so what would engender that? It's the mind, all the mind stuff telling us we need to get this person to do more, get more results out of them, work longer, send them an email at nine o'clock and ask them to respond. And it's the heart is the one that's saying, you got to keep it in balance, like you, just like you said. And yeah. until we get there, you're going to have people just, and by the way, there was a, just today, there's a report that was in the Business Insider that showed that 75% of Americans are considering a job change. Microsoft showed it was 40% about two months ago. And that's a preposterous number. That's four in 10 people saying, screw yeah. this, I'm leaving. I'm getting out of here. I can't put up with this anymore. And now it's 75%. 
this is not about money. This is about mm -hmm. this. It's about, am I being managed well? Am I being led well? Is this an organization I, that, that, I, that I believe in? Do they value me? Do I matter here? And it's no, 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 no. And so yeah. this is why people are looking to go somewhere else. Well, it's interesting you bring that up because I, uh, I've been watching a lot of YouTubes around generational leadership. And I believe that it's, uh, it, it's not just when you're born. It's how you were parented, how you were loved, how you were taught, how you were led. And it, we, we grow up with certain agreements that we make with ourselves and our parents and our friends. Uh, certainly the environment in which we thrive in and don't. But it's also the courage to tell yourself that I'm, I'm feeling something, I'm afraid of something, but are you going to stay fearful? Are you going to hide? Or are you going to step up and ask for what you want? And I believe whether it's 4 out of 10 or 7 out of 10, if we were a little bit better, Mark Crowley, if we were a little bit better at asking for what we want, that person that's above us, so to speak, you call it manager or boss, I might call it leader, I'm just going to say that we might get what we want. But because we get disgruntled and we start tweeting this and Instagramming that and chat timing this, I, I'm wondering... It's both sides that need to come together and say, what's not working? Now, if the person isn't willing to even listen, sure, be one of the four, be one of the seven and go find something else. But there's a lot of people, regardless of when you were born, recognizing that there's a better opportunity out there. My ask is at least give the person that you chose and the person who chose you an opportunity to at least explain where they're coming from and what it is the company really needs and how you may or may not fit in. Um, you know, I don't chalk it up to loyalty as much as I chalk it up to why are we so afraid to have a conversation where both people have to share what's in here instead of always, you know, talking from the top of our head. I think it, I think a lot of it boils down to the fact that what I'm talking about uses up more energy. So in other words, in order to do what you just described, which is to find out and say, hey, Greg, what are you, tell me specifically, like, mm -hmm. what's important to you about work? Like, what are you hoping to get from work in exchange for, you know, separate from a paycheck, but every day you come in here, what are you hoping to get? Is it growth? Do you want my job? Do you want to be the CEO? Are you happy doing what you're doing? Would you like to cross train? Would you like right. more? So it's finding out. And then once you find out, you then have to give that to them if you want to make that work. So yeah. if I have 30 people working for me or 20 people working for me, and I have 20 different people that aren't all Greg, so you might want one thing, somebody else might want another. Now I got to figure out how am I going to give this to all these people? And so a lot of managers just go, screw it. I'm not going to do it. Everybody's going to be one size, one shape, <laughs> all fits all. And, you know, and so then people quit and we go, you know, well, they were never committed in the first place or they weren't very very good or they didn't get along with people and we yeah. rationalize all this turnover. And so, you know, ultimately if people would have those conversations and make a commitment to giving people what they want, you can have that win-win where people don't leave. I never had people quit working for me. I just didn't. No. Um, so when I hear all this turnover, I'm like, that's a reflection of leadership. It's not a reflection of the employee. Absolutely. Thank you. And I'm going to put a bow on this and ask you to, because you said a couple words that trigger uh, something I believe that we as, as human beings today need to do much better. And that is own our relationships and own the relationships with a, with a, uh, a spirit of love, a spirit of trust, uh, beyond being authentic. And yes, yes, it takes time. It takes energy. It, take, it takes effort. But if we don't stop wasting time on things that don't matter and we don't start making time for things that do matter, your spouse, your kids, the people that you invited into your organization, this world's not going to get any better, Mark. And I'm sitting here telling parents across the world, if we could do something a little bit better, a little bit different than our own parents did, and, and some say, well, I wasn't parented wrong. I, I'm not saying it was wrong, but they, that was then. What does the world need now? So final question for you, Mr. Crowley. If you were speaking to a group of 25 to 30-year-olds and they all came to you in this huge auditorium with one single question and they said, what can we do to be better leaders tomorrow than anybody else? What would you tell them? 
love your people. Um, love and, your people. And, and by the way, yeah, and 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 truthfully, when I first said it, so I it, it's been a journey for me, you know. Mm -hmm. So I've become more and more. I got a lot of rejection for this, for this whole idea, and so I had to kind of figure out, okay, how do you couch it? Every human being, what we need in order to thrive is love. Whether we want to acknowledge it or not, that's the truth. And all positive emotions literally translate into love. So if you could just be more thoughtful with people, if you could just be more appreciative of people, if you can give people your time send them an article that you read over the weekend and said hey bill i thought of you when i read this people are like you think of me outside of work <laughs> it goes right here and that yeah. is love and so really you know i'm counting on the millennials to be honest with you as, as ceos to say mm -hmm. we're not going to approach leadership from an exploitive standpoint we're going to approach it from a how do we make it work for you and the organization yeah. and all other stakeholders that's the future but it really starts with individual managers saying the people that work for me i'm going to make sure that they feel loved and you never have to use that language you never have to say it out loud just show it to them in the way that you interact with them well, I want to thank you, Mark Crowley. And if anyone's on Twitter, I know you all are. It's at Mark Crowley, and his book is Lead from the Heart. It's 10 years old, but it's still out there. Uh, it's coming. He's coming up with a new one this summer, or next summer, I should say. Mark, just between you and I, I tell you, um, I felt like I've met somebody that I should have met a long time ago. And I'm not shooting you or shooting me. I'm just saying that I, I can't imagine how much more advanced my leadership coaching in my training, in my service to others as a, as a coach and a consultant would have ramped up if I would have met you five years ago. But um, it's not an if, when, th could have, it's just, a, it's just a comment. And the world needs more of you, Mark. And uh, keep saying what you say on Twitter. I really appreciate it. That's how I found you. I uh, appreciate your time. I'm gonna get a few books and, ha and hand them out at a, at a conference I'm speaking at in, in November. It's about leaders in the housing area. I mean, leaders are leaders, and uh, I'm going to make sure that the, the people that participate receive, receive one of your books. Mark Crowley, I appreciate you very much, and uh, I look forward to doing this again soon. Maybe we can have one of your, your former uh, employees on the show with us one day and learn even more about you. Wow, that'd be fun. Yeah. That'd be fun. Yeah, that'd be fun. By the way, Greg, before I go, it's Mark C. Crowley on Twitter. I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. At Mark C. is in Charlie Crowley. And uh, follow him. You'll enjoy it. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate you. Thank right. you, Greg. And thank, thank you all that, you betcha. Thank you all that have been listening. I appreciate you very much. This is another episode of Servant Leadership Podcast with Greg Aiden. Go out and be kind, be considerate. Show somebody that you love them. Don't have to say it. Just show them. Have a great day. God bless.